It's my nerd world, and welcome to it, Depeche Mode, the podcast. And on this week's episode, diving deeper into Memento Mori, having had several more listens to the album since last week's episode. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, Mojo Depeche Mode article that came out uh, last week. Some really interesting insight that I want to share with you. Fan spotlight for this week and listener feedback. Again, thank you so much for checking out this week's show. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to... My Nerd World. It is My Nerd World, Depeche Mode, the podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. Excited to talk about all things Depeche Mode once again uh, this week and get to a lot of listener feedback. I really can't thank you enough for reaching out to the show and uh, looking forward to sharing a lot of your thoughts, answering your questions, especially as it relates to the upcoming Depeche Mode album, which I've had the privilege of listening to many times now. So to give you a bit of uh, a bit of perspective on listening to the uh, to, to the album, it really hasn't been until I'm recording this on Thursday, and it really wasn't until Tuesday of this week that I was able to do sort of a proper listen and now several proper listens to the to the album. So as I mentioned on uh, last week's episode, I really messed my leg up two weeks ago slipping on some black ice outside and then uh, de- did uh, did further damage to it because I didn't rest it. So in the days after I injured myself, I was up walking around and I just tore the heck out of the ligaments. And so I ended up taking um, several days off of work. We had a huge storm that rolled through uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis uh, last week. So I was off at home uh, through half of last week and then laid up all weekend, did the show from home on Friday and didn't return to work until Tuesday. So why does this relate to Depeche Mode? Because I was finally able to get into the car and drive and listen to the album while driving. And that wasn't to say that I hadn't been listening to it and really, really enjoying it, but to really get a a, a sense and a vibe on the album to be engaged in, you know, one of the things that I do most often when I'm listening to Depeche Mode music, and that is driving. I have about a 20-minute drive uh, to work every day. And then usually when I go and I get to work, I plug in my headphones as I leave the uh, the parking lot and then head into the building up on the fifth floor, and I've got to run around and copy prep and things like that. So I've really had an opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with the album in the normal circumstances that I listen to Depeche Mode. And I, I again, I just have to tell you that this album has absolutely grown on me. Uh, and, and I'll be talking about this as we get into a lot of the listener feedback that I that I mentioned before. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the album, so I'm going to reserve a lot of commentary um, about it for when we get into listener feedback and work through the emails and YouTube posts that you've sent to me. But let me add a couple of things before we talk uh, about that Mojo interview that I mentioned and we get into that listener feedback and fan spotlight. Um, one thing that I picked up on that uh, really began to stick out in a good way in listening to the album while driving uh, this week. Dave really varies his voice on this album. I'm actually very, I'm actually interested in going back and listening to previous records to see how much he does this. Because I, I guess I haven't noticed it before, you know, and I've listened to every single Depeche Mode album, who knows how many times for crying out loud. But for some reason on this album, he really varies... And changes up his tone and his range to match the mood of the song. If you watched the... It was one of the documentaries for... Oh, it was for Sounds of the Universe, yeah. And when they're working on Wrong, if you watched one of the documentaries, uh, it was on the box set for for Sounds of the Universe. There's a, a good chunk where they're where Dave's doing the vocals and working out the vocals for wrong. And he's, and he's there with Ben Hillier and Martin's there. And Ben is telling him to sort of nasty it up and telling him to sort of change and get more menacing and delivering the, the lyrics. And so Dave's done this before, but it's really apparent on this record and it, and it works really well. So um, a song like don't say you love me, which is, is a huge highlight for me on this album. Uh, it has this very dramatic, um, 
tone to it. The pacing, as I mentioned on last week's episode, is a lot like Poison Heart, uh, but it's this it's this twisted love song of you know you, you be this and I'll be this and in in. And you be this and I'll be this throughout the song. And the lyrics are just dark and and fantastic. And Dave really plays up the drama in that song. If you've listened to the live version of Wagging Tongue on the album, which is better in my opinion, of both that and my favorite, Stranger, and I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. He does the same thing on Wagging Tongue. Uh, and I've, I'm interested to go back and listen to previous records to to see if I just didn't notice it before which I would kind of have a hard time thinking. You know, as I go back and, you know, think about wrong, and yeah, he kind of changed it up there, but it's really apparent here, and I, 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 I like it. I really, really dig it. A lot of people have been commenting to me, especially on Twitter, and uh, I don't want to say taking issue with my saying it's the best album they've released since Songs of Faith and Devotion, and I can understand why. You know, people are like, what are you talking about? And some people have brought up my previous comments of spirit from like seven years ago. And I'll share that with you here in a moment. When I make that comment, I, I want to frame it this way. In my opinion, Memento Mori is the best collection of songs in terms of quality. I can't say enough that the album is its own thing while still being holy Depeche Mode. Um. I've been listening to this album as start to finish lis- listening sessions. Whereas like on spirit. And again, I'll get into this coming up. Um, I listened to that album as a whole a few times, but then I specifically remember going through and making a playlist and taking out some of the songs that I didn't enjoy. I haven't done this on this album, even with the one song that still hasn't grabbed me yet. The standouts continue to be, Soul for me, Soul with me, Don't Say You Love Me, Before We Drown, People Are Good, and uh, Ghosts Again. And Ghost Again is clearly the best choice to be the single on the album. Like, if I had any complaint, I wish that the songs, not the songs, but I just, Ghosts Again to me is such a great song, and it fits perfectly within the album, but... I kind of, I kind of, I'm kind of going. Oh, I, I just wish that we had like one more of those. And that isn't. I, I don't want to. That's not me saying anything bad about the rest of the album. That is just to say that Ghosts Again to me is just a fantastic song, and in my opinion, the best, the best single they've released since um, Enjoy the Silence. Uh, the one song that still hasn't quite landed for me yet is Never Let Me Go. I actually listened to it right before I started the podcast again, just to sort of clarify my thoughts on it, and. Um, It's got a moment in the middle that I really enjoy, but as I said before, it's the so much love, soft touch, raw nerve, soothe my soul, and specifically Lillian. And it wasn't until this most recent listen that I went, oh my gosh, it actually has a very strong Lillian vibe. I'm not the biggest fan of Lillian. Uh, I'm not actually, I'm not very much of a fan of Lillian at all off of playing the angel. Um, If I'm listening to the album, I'll probably skip it. Um, if I'm doing a whole listen, it's 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 fine, it's serviceable, but it's not a track that I ever go back to and say, I want to listen to Lillian. This song almost <laughs> feels like an apology to that. I like it better than Lillian, but it's the only song that um, hasn't quite landed for me. That being said, I haven't skipped it once when listening to the album. Last week, I mentioned that Always You was the other one that I wasn't quite sold on. Um, that song has absolutely uh, grown on me. And if you like the instrumentation on Ghosts Again, you will love the way the rest of the album sounds. Hearing it on on you know on repeat, you really just just pick up just so much going on in the background of those songs. And um, Always You was one that I also had. I, I listened to the whole album while I was working on notes for the for the show, so that's another reason why it's kind of fresh in my mind. But Always You, whereas I, I found it a little bit repetitious, that song has really, really grown on me. And um, it's, it's slowly sort of climbing the charts of, uh, charts of the songs on the album that I really enjoy. The one thing that I'm very curious about is how these songs are going to translate live. Uh, the album has definitely got a groove. Uh, but I imagine a lot of these songs are going to have to be beefed up to work out live. They They... This isn't a negative, but they don't have sort of that epic presence to them. Like when you hear Never Let Me Down Again, for example, I'm probably the easiest example. I mean, that just screams 
to be to be performed live. There aren't necessarily um, any tracks on this album that, to me, feel that way. Uh, even Ghosts Again that we've seen them do live so far has been it's been good. Uh, and I, I'm just I'm curious how that's going to translate to a big stadium. Um, I can't imagine a song like Don't Say You Love Me that's very, that's kind of a slower, I want to say dirge, but it's just got this dun 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 to it, that if they were to punch that up a bit on the drums and with some really dramatic lighting, I could see that really, really working well. Before we drown, too, uh, People Are Good is the one song that I could I could definitely see see working live. I'll be very interested to see if they do it live. It is my second favorite song on the record. It, hands down. I absolutely love that song. As I talked about last week, it's kind of goofy. You'll know what I'm talking about when you hear it. It definitely falls in line with some of the 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 way the lyrics were <laughs> were written back in the 80s of keep it in your memory, now this is fun. Uh, I said before that it sounds like Martin wanted to do a follow-up to People Are People, uh, it's got this amazing 80s Depeche Mode vibe to it. Um, kind of on the nose in terms of the way that it's written uh, lyrically. So, But I could definitely see that working uh, working live. And as an example, uh, we've heard the live versions of Wagging Tongue and My Favorite Stranger, although, you know, I'll be at bad versions of it, bad recordings. So, you know, we've kind of gotten a preview of what we can expect um, live of the album versions. In my opinion, the album versions are are much much better than what we've heard so far live. I expected the guitar to be a lot harder on my favorite my favorite stranger hearing the live recording first, and it was very different, edgy, but way less rock and more processed on the album. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, the band hasn't really gone down the road of playing a vast majority of the new album on the recent tours in in a long time. I mean, long gone are the days where you almost get the entire album, you know, performed live during these uh, tours. So I'm uh, very interested to see how this, how it plays out. Based off of, too, the number of songs that they performed live already, I mean, I think we kind of know they're going to be doing Personal Jesus, obviously, but Precious, they seem to be returning to and then ghosts again wagging tongue my favorite stranger i definitely see why dave made the comment that he did a while back after the press conference saying that they could potentially go and do the sun and the rainfall now whether or not they're brave enough to pull that out based off of how many songs they need to play live and making sure they get the typical songs that the band wants to play live remains to be seen. But I could definitely see how that song could work into a live format based on the tracks from Memento Mori, especially Soul With Me. That would be, I could see Martin doing his own version of uh, The Sun and the Rainfall with Soul With Me. I just, I... I, I pray that Martin does a full, the fully produced version of Soul With Me. That song is so cinematic. Um, definitely, it's 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 that melancholy sadness again because it is the lyrics are absolutely about death. Martin's taking his soul with me, taking my soul with me. That's how that lyric works out, and it's got this very uplifting tone, even though it's definitely talking about death. But it's just so bold on the record that I, I I really, really hope Martin doesn't do like a stripped down piano or just guitar version uh, version of that song. So, all right, let's uh, dive into uh, some of that Mojo article that I mentioned, and we'll uh, do that via a uh, email that I received from uh, Jason. All right, so Jason writes, my favorite stranger performed in Munich is apparently a real rock number. Meh, yeah. It's it next to um, "Never Let Me Go" are probably the the two that I would say are the are the rockier numbers. Although people are good would from a keyboard standpoint, of a sort of a harder keyboard stand a standpoint, I could put that in that same category in terms of pacing. Uh, not listening to the uh, uh, not listened to the recording on YouTube as I don't want the want to uh, ruin the release date. 
Uh, Jason says it's important to hear the songs in the context of the album, as I believe it gives a better sense of meaning and belonging. Uh, not sure if you got a digital copy of the UK magazine Mojo. I did. Uh, he provided me with an excerpt from it that I wanted to share with you on the uh, on the show. It really is a fantastic uh, read. Very, very insightful. Uh, and actually gave me some information that I was not even aware of in terms of the band dynamics. But let me share with you this portion from the uh, Mojo magazine if you haven't had a chance to read it yet. Uh, the thoughts are reflected... Uh, talking about an, es- an, an extract from it um, as it relates to the album, uh, in a record that feels more open than any Depeche Mode have made in a while, perhaps since 1997's Ultra. Its melodies are persuasive. It's sound world rich and elegant. Completely agree. It looks inward. Absolutely. Uh, as all Depeche Mode music does, except for a lot of tracks on Spirit, eschewing the political preoccupations of the didactic spirit, a little too literal reckons gone. Uh, People Are Good is probably the only one that kind of looks outward more, but it absolutely works for the song. Uh, That's not in the Mojo article. That's my comments there. But the balance between celestial synth motifs and agonized soul searching, exemplified by the lead-off track Ghosts Again, is close to ideal. Hardcore fans and more casual admirers alike will be pleasantly surprised, but not as surprised as Gone was when Gore sent him the demos because there was something unusual about them. Martin FaceTimed me, says Gone, and said, I have to warn you, on a couple of songs, it's Richard Butler singing. I'm dying to hear those demos, by the way. I can hear Richard Butler's voice on the songs that he wrote with Martin. Absolutely, I could hear his voice. That's not saying I hear it when I hear Dave. When I listen to the song and I want to hear Richard Butler's voice, I can go, yeah, I can totally see him singing this song. That's what I meant. Gore had been friends with Butler, the gravel-voiced psychedelic furs frontman, for years when the pandemic hit. He just reached out to me and said, we should write some songs, recalls Gore. I think he might have said that once before, but it never kind of went anywhere. This time I texted him back and said, got any ideas? Butler had some uh, some ideas, and the pair batted them back and forth. The first song we wrote, we ended up throwing away, says Gore, but the standard kept getting better and better. Sometimes I would write a line, and he would write a line, or he would write a verse melody, and I would write a melody eight. There were all kinds of approaches. Gone was taken aback. It was a big it was a, such a big leap for Martin to write someone, somebody uh, with somebody else, he says. He was taking a risk because he's so particular about things. He likes everything in its place uh, as he likes it. But Gone also daunted. The demos set to unusual challenges, especially the keynote ghosts again. When I first heard that demo, it made me feel immediately full of joy, but an odd feeling for me. I had to get past hearing Richard singing because he's got a, re- a, a really distinctive tone and style. But there was something about this melody and his um, intonation that I warmed to. And some of the lyrics lent heavily into Richard's repertoire repertoire of imagery. Yeah, let's put it that way, which I really identified with. The Gore Butler co-writes are some of Depeche Mode's strongest songs and Gone's strongest performances in years. The stately and lyrical Don't Say You Love Me, for instance, is a singer's showcase in the Scott Walker lineage. Yeah, that song is is just fantastic. It's it's so good. It's so Scott Walker enthuses gone. It was weird it, it's a it was a weird coincidence because I've been listening to a lot of Scott, songs like Sundown. Sundown, you better take care. Uh, and A Woman Left Lonely, those torch-like melodies. Gone himself, along with regular songwriting partners, including touring DM uh, members Christian uh, Eigner and Peter Gordino, contributes two songs, plus a co-writing with Gore entitled Wagging Tongue. They're first to make it onto a Depeche Mode album. Gone attacks it uh, as if he's angry at someone, but who? And that speaks to the way that uh, Dave sings the, the vocals. I'm not sure, says Gone. I'm ranting at somebody. There was a part of it that came to me literally just after I got the news that Mark uh, Lanigan had passed away. Uh, Rich, a machin of Soul Savers, rang me and said, "Uh, Lanigan's gone, mate. Gone had got to know the ex-Screaming Trees singer through Soul Savers, for whom they'd both starred as guest vocalists, although the pair had admired, uh, admired each other's work for years. The Depeche Man was, he says, surprised but not shocked 
Wynn Lanigan, who had survived multiple addictions and rolls of the dice uh, of the lifestyle dice, gave up the ghost in February of 2022. When I saw him, we saw him as a freak of nature. Gone shakes his head. Look at what uh, got him in the end. Who knows? Look what got him in the end. Who knows? But he had a terrible bout of COVID, had a terrible fall. He spent a good couple of months in the hospital in Ireland anyway. There was a part of this song that came out of that. Gone pauses. Storyteller, Mark, was a great storyteller, just with his voice. He didn't even have to follow him lyrically sometimes. I knew through his tone where he was. Another of Gon's songs closes the album. Speak to Me flames out in an epic uh, swirl of sound. Both Gore and producer James Ford credit engineer Marta Salongni for the ethereal analog tape treatments that grace this and other uh, songs. Think of uh, Frippertronics, they both say. The lyric finds its narrator in a lonely place, reaching out in desperation. Is it, is it an addiction song? That's definitely in there because it's built into me now, says Gone. The power of that feeling of just disappearing with a drug and the power of asking for help. But also, there's a part in there where I was, in part, talking to Martin. I don't want to have something between us that we... I want to have something between us that we hadn't had up until this point. I don't know what that is, and it's kind of a bit terrifying because what if it doesn't work? One of the other uh, items of note in that Mojo article was the uh, relationship between Dave and Martin. Uh, The understanding that I got reading Mojo was that it seemed like the, the band itself was a bit of a gang going up and all the way through when things began to fall apart during the devotional tour and the numerous problems that all of the band members were, were dealing with. And then subsequently, Dave's overdose, you know, Fletch's, um, you know, leaving the tour, the second leg of the tour, the exotic tour. Uh, I think Martin was still having his drinking issues at the time. And then Alan leaves and Dave comes back from his overdose. The band decides to move forward. And then we get on this four-year cycle they put out ultra they don't do a big tour they do the singles tour afterwards with the with the with the release of of uh, of the singles and then you know we're, we're kind of off and running with the series of albums that we've gotten since then and this distance between them and the vibe that i got was that it turned more into something of a i don't want to say job but there was definitely sort of a cycle they the three of them would get together they'd find the producer and they worked with the producer for you know several years they do the album they'd go on tour and then they'd all split up and probably not talk to each other and then when it was time to come back together they would go through the whole process again and it doesn't sound like dave and and martin were actually very close beyond creating the albums together and with fletch being the the individual who brought them together, sort of the mediary that kind of kept it, kept them working the way that they did. Dave spells out that they needed to become friends. And if you've watched the interviews, and there was a brand new interview that came out on uh, one of uh, Klein from K Rock, uh, that interview in particular, uh, which is really funny actually. I'll probably grab the audio for next week's show. I just didn't have time today. I. I was going to, and then I was just putting the notes together and realized the show was already going to be long without adding more audio to it. But uh, they mentioned that the new movie Cocaine Bear features Just Can't Get Enough, and it's the first time that Dave and Martin find out about it. And there's this great moment between the two of them where you can just genu- you can genuinely tell they're enjoying their time together. And we've seen it on stage with, with them. I, I, I feel like those moments are very genuine. When Dave's in his element, Martin's in his element, they're up there, they're performing... And, you know, Dave gets that smile on his face. They go back to back while they're performing on stage. I I don't see those as being scripted. And I know that if you go and see multiple shows, Dave has for decades now done variations of the same routine every single night while on tour. And those moments with Martin are included in that. But I've always taken them as still being very, very genuine. Like he's he's genuinely having... And, and authentically having a good time while he's uh, up there. So if you haven't had the opportunity to read the entirety of that uh, Mojo article, it's a little long, but I would definitely uh, encourage you to go and uh, and check that out. 
All right, let's get to this week's fan spotlight. I separate some of these emails out. A lot of you have um, shorter comments and questions. And then I asked for a few weeks back um, your Depeche Mode stories. And so I've compiled those together. And every week I go and highlight one. This one comes from Matthew in Santa Cruz. Uh, Matthew says, thank you so much for the podcast. I've been listening to it for a little over four years now, which has me laughing because I didn't realize I've been doing it for that long. Always enjoy the shows, but I especially want to express my appreciation for your recent coverage regarding everything surrounding Memento Mori. I have not been this excited for a DM album in years. Yes, I'm always excited about their new releases, but there is something different about this one. I can't put my finger on it. And I'm with you uh, 100%. When I make those comparisons back to Songs of Faith and Devotion, Violator, Music for the Masses, there's something about this record that just has that feeling for me. Um, and and there hasn't been an album. And even Spirit, while I made comparisons to Violator when Spirit came out, and I've definitely changed my tune on that. Um, and I'll, again, talk about that here in just a moment. I still didn't quite have that same sort of magic spark that I got on those records from, you know, the, the, the late eighties and, and, uh, and early to mid to mid nineties so with Memento Mori. It's given it to me uh, getting back to uh, Matthew's email. I heard ghost again today, actually played it over 30 times, loving it so far. It gives me strong hopes that this could be one of their best album in years. Uh, I do agree with some that their last three or four albums have not been their career best, but every one of those albums had amazing songs. I agree. It's it's uh, just really hard to compare music for the masses, Black Celebration, Violator. Um, not a fair comparison. I started out as a Depeche Mode fan in '88. My first concert to ever was 101. Lived just a couple of miles away in Eagle Rock. Yep, know where that is. Uh, from that point, I um, from that point on, always went to two or three shows every tour. Highlight shows uh, for me were, of course, 101, Violator shows, Universal Amphitheater. Yep, and the two at Dodger Stadium. Yep. And uh, actually, the solo shows with Martin and Dave. I have not seen any of Martin and Dave's solo shows. I'm sad to admit. Yes, I was at the Warehouse Riot. Did not get to see them. Did get kicked in the stomach by one of the Riot police, though. (laughs) Wow. During the Violator era, when the band was going to the different stations for interviews, I had two members of the band. I heard two members of the band were going to K-Rock one night. And uh, the same night, two were going to another local radio station called Power 106. Matthew, you're taking me back, man. It's my era and my radio stations. I knew there would be a lot of fans at K-Rock, so I thought it might be a good idea to go head over to Power 106 since most fans did not really listen to that station. Absolutely true. I somehow was able to pass the security of the building and went up the elevator to the floor of the radio station. Hung out in the lobby for about an hour. The elevator doors open, and out came Andy and Alan. They were super nice. They signed my Enjoy the Silence 12-inch. Someone from their team gave me a signed picture of the band as well. At some point, Andy jokingly said, Who let this guy in here? Referring to me, and then nudged me on the shoulder. I spent about 20 minutes with them as they had an impromptu meeting. What a surreal moment. Dude, that's awesome. Anyway, excited for my next big DM moment on March 23rd in Sacramento, also going to San Jose. I have second row center seats, which I can't believe I got, but how weird it will uh, will it be to have the album come out the day before. Thanks again for the podcast. Man, that's awesome. Uh, and it just and it takes me back to all of my time living in Southern California during that era. You know, and for those that for those that, like Matthew that, you know, I'm I'm 50. And for those that were listening to Depeche Mode in Southern California during that time, during your Music for the Masses, Violator, and Songs of Faith and Devotion time, um, you know what I'm talking about. For those that don't, um, I imagine the best equivalent would probably be a lot of the fans in Berlin, just because the band has such a close tie to Berlin. But I'll just tell you that that time in Southern California, to be a Depeche Mode fan was... It was just truly incredible. It was truly and absolutely incredible. I went through my collectibles recently. As I mentioned, I've been posting some up as shorts on the YouTube page and also on my TikTok at the the John Justice, J-O-N. And um, I found a whole bunch of pictures completely unrelated to Depeche Mode from that era. But it was all surrounding Depeche Mode because at that point in time, it was just, it was my life. I mean, they've always been a part of my life since 85. But um, in that moment, in that time, especially in Southern California, it was just, it was like you were living Depeche Mode. 
It was it was truly an amazing and incredible time. So thank you for that trip uh, down uh, memory lane there, Matthew. I greatly appreciate it. All right, uh, let's get to the listener feedback this week. First one comes from Amy Roth. Awesome episode. Thank you. Talking about the review. Been a fan since the mid-80s. Can't wait to hear the full album. Excited to attend the concert. Uh, what would be your dream set list? Do you have one on Spotify or uh, Apple Music to share? I don't, but I'm going to put one together between now and next week. Because I always do fantasy playlists in my head. Um, and uh, Or fantasy set lists in my head. So I'll definitely do that before next week. And thank you for the message. Uh, let's see. Henry Co ask what's the title for the snippet we heard back in october on the press conference the first snippet before ghosts again so all right i think i can get away with this because i've played this before on the show so what i'm going to play for you here is the snippet that was played before the snippet of ghosts again from the press conference as henry mentioned this is from my cosmos is mine what's really interesting is though it's completely different, not completely different. It's different than what's on the album. What I'm going to play for you here is buried in the mix of the song towards the end. But what I can tell you is the pacing on this is the pacing of the song. So, nope, that's Ghost again. My bad. I have him numbered over here, so forgive me. Uh, th- so the the beat that hits right at the start of this I thought it was the very beginning of My Cosmos is Mine. It's not. There's actually a couple of them in succession. uh, But it's really, really close. Okay. So you get this ethereal moment here, right? And there's a lot of this going on in the back of the song of My Cosmos is Mine. The beat will kick in here in a second. That's the pace of the song. And what you hear there, Martin's vocals portion of the lyric, Sun by Day, and it's in the track, but again, it's right at the very end, but that's the pacing of my cosmos is mine. And then the when, it's, when it transitions over into the snippet from the press conference, um, they just mix the two together. Um, and they definitely took a part of Ghost again and reworked it for the snippet. So I have no doubt that they took the parts and tried to make that snippet specifically to give you a vibe. But that's the... That's the pacing for uh, My Cosmos is uh, is mine. I shouldn't get dinged for that. That's from the press conference. That's not from the album. All right. Um, so I have a couple of here from uh, DD Day. I'm assuming it's Esquire, E-S-Q who's also heard the album and is going to share his thoughts with you. So, uh, DD writes, I got to hear the album earlier. It's certainly better than Spirit and Sounds of the Universe. I really like My Cosmos is Mine, Don't Say You Love Me, and Caroline's Monkey. That one is particularly good. The only two I'll be skipping are Ghosts Again, the one DM song that gets worse the more I hear it, tells you how subjective it is, and the last track, was, which was a bit too Soul Savers for me. Production is the usual, flat. Um, inoffensive, nothing special. But overall, not bad. 7 out of 10 based on one play. And again, it being subjected, I totally agree with the production being flat. Doesn't sound flat at all uh, to me. Um, it actually sounds a lot better uh, than even Spirit. In Spirit, I really enjoyed the production. He goes on to say, uh, Speak to Me was the one where I cringed a little bit. That's the last song on the record. I don't think that'll be one of my favorites. It's certainly not Cover Me or Should Be Higher, which, in my opinion, are Dave's best DM songs, as well as Broken. Um, I asked him how he heard it, and he said, uh, well, I'll leave that 
Oh, he put it up online. I can read it to you. Uh, I got a friend who works for BBC uh, Radio 6, and he got a hold of a copy. Only got one listen, unfortunately, so got to wait a month now until I hear it again. You're right about Caroline's Monkey. Even though I've only heard it once, it's logged. Uh, it's uh, lodged in my brain. Yeah, um, I, DD, I'll be really interested to see how you feel about the record and some of your thoughts on it once you have a chance to hear it a few times. Uh, because it's definitely grown on me um, quite a bit. All right, Mr. Missing Real writes, The secret of a good classic DM album is that eight to ten tracks are more than enough. Four weaker bonus tracks ruins the whole experience for me. I'm an album guy, and I hate skipping tracks. I never had to skip a single track on Black Celebration or Music for the Masses. I think you might be pleasantly surprised with this record. I, I do think that they could have moved a couple of tracks off to bonus tracks and made more, a tighter album but again i listen i don't know how many times i'm I'm trying to think of how many times i've been to work this week listening to it there and back it runs about 48 minutes which answers another email here so plus i listen to it at home so i don't know i mean over a dozen times easy and um i haven't skipped any tracks on it so um alex uh alexander roglev and i hope i said shared your name right uh, comment and didn't you have the same thoughts as you listened to spirit for the first time or does the new album really stand out after the first listenings yes when i first and if you go back and listen to my review of spirit you can hear this for yourself um i had a lot i had a i had spirit um rated much higher on the first few listens than how it ended up settling in for me that being said um going backwards where's the revolution a Poison Heart, Fail, uh, The Worst Crime, Cover Me. All of those songs are still right up there with the era that I point back to so often. I love those songs. Um, but the other ones on the album were kind of never really landed for me. I thought they would grow on me at the time that I listened the first time, but they never did. This album has been a much different experience. Because, like I said, apart from Never Let Me Go, which I have not skipped yet, all the other songs, when they start, I look forward to listening to and have not skipped them. So, uh, yeah, you know, my views changed on Spirit. It was a little too outward for me. The political stuff just didn't just didn't jive with me. Okay, James writes, I've only heard the live versions of Wagging Tongue and My Favorite Stranger, and they've already, and already to me, this album blows uh, the past uh, last two, Spirit and Delta Machine. I feel like they found themselves again. Thank you, uh, James. Dustin Cozy writes, what's the running time on the album? Uh, 48 minutes. Uh, 48 minutes and change. I hope there are some good lengths, uh, length songs on it. Sometimes I get disappointed when the songs come and go, go uh, so quickly. Uh, the only song that clocks in at five uh, past five minutes is uh, My Cosmos is Mine. Uh, the rest of them are running in the you know three and then four range. And usually I would agree with a comment like that, but I'll tell you, with 12 tracks being on the album and based on the length, it, it really works. Because the album just flows. It it really, it just, it the, the placement of the songs on the album is spot on, in my opinion, and at no time am I wanting, or, you know, wanting for more as we, I feel, I feel satisfied after every song. That being said, I did do the extended mix using the instrumental version and the album version. No, no, I'm sorry, the radio edit. I used the instrumental version and the radio edit of Ghosts Again, and that's up available on the YouTube page. Plus, I threw in the um, the Berlin sample that I played for you a moment ago. Made an extended cut of Ghosts Again. And I really like the extended cut that I made because I just I extended some of the keyboard aspects of it on the on the on the uh, on the track that I really like in the song and uh to me it just makes it even more uplifting but uh again at 48 minutes with not too many you know with, with the songs being the length that they are I think they they did a really good job uh sneer me writes what impact on the sound of the record do you think Marta Salongni had she uh, is known for using tape machines, which I presume give the sound, give the sound, or create the sound on this special unreal texture, reverb, etc. Is this present throughout the album? It is, and you can definitely hear it. If she's the one responsible for a lot of the stuff going on in the background of the songs, 
then that's where you're hearing her. Because there's much more going on. Uh, there's there's a lot more going on within the tracks than what they did on Spirit. And I really liked James Ford's production work. But as I mentioned last week, it reminds me a lot of Nine Inch Nails and the Downward Spiral, where you listen to it on good headphones and you just hear a lot of things going on that adds to the overall um, uh, ambiance and gives it that cinematic feel that we really haven't had on, on a Depeche Mode record in a uh, in a while. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Somebody takes issue with me. Um, Landless KC writes, been listening for a few weeks, really enjoying your show. You seem knowledgeable, and I love the enthusiasm. I'm also a big um, Commander slash Princess Leia fan and grew up on Star Wars. Nice. However... How can you diss Ultra like you do? I didn't realize that I did, but okay. Of all their albums, it it is the one that I turn to the most, okay? Okay, it's not very pop synth, but I so adore the bluesy rock and roll vibe of Songs of Faith and Devotion, PTA, and Ultra. I love what they do with rock songs as much as I love their hard-hitting dance songs and their broody alternative stuff. Anyway, I just don't get it. Well, I, I like Ultra. I mean, I'm may have made some comments there's some tracks on that album on that record album record i keep going back and forth that i skip free state never landed with me at all that song just does not work for me at all my favorite songs tend to change and move around the playlist as time goes by and i go back to some great reward and black celebration as well as exciter and delta machine so do i so i pretty much like everything as do i but i just feel the need to defend my beloved ultra and the punch to the gut vibe of that great album. Has it, somebody please fill me in. Was I negative on Ultra at some point in time? I mean, I like that record. <laughs> I like all their records. I don't think I've ever said I, there was a the best mode record I didn't like. Uh, you know, and they, they kind of shift in terms of which ones I like more. I don't do... Um, I don't do lists, you know, from best... I don't do best to worst worst lists. I don't do them for Depeche Mode albums, and I don't do them for Star Wars movies. And I don't because my my views on them change, and they move around based off of where I, are, where I am in life. But I gen, genuinely like Ultra. So I don't know why you got that vibe, but that's okay. Uh, thanks for being there during the countdown meltdown and listening to, much bit, listening to us bitch about tickets, ticket prices this year. Yeah, I still haven't gotten tickets to a show, man, and I don't know what I'm going to do. All right, instrumental electronic music rights. I heard the version of my favorite stra- stranger uh, in Munich. Just want to know if uh, Dave is singing the chorus wrong in the middle of the song. It sounded like that. No. Um, my favorite stranger has this break in the middle of the song, which you can hear in the live version that leaked out, that gets really weird. It's super long. It sounds like it was a mistake. At one point, it feels like they actually flipped the track. And it runs like backwards for a second. It's really strange, but it works. It's very experimental. I I, I, I dig it. I mean, it reminds me of some of the stuff that they were doing that was a little sort of oddball. Oddball by Depeche Mode standards. Like on Music for the the Masses. You know, some of the the breathier stuff. And the sampling that they were doing during that era. It gets really kind of cool in the middle. So that was not a mistake. The live version is is the way the song goes. Uh, Delph writes, John, on a global level, do uh, guitars play a big role in Memento Mori? How many songs would be like Never Let Me Go or My Favorite Stranger with an important uh, role of the guitar? Those are really the only two, and I wouldn't even have... I mean, they are guitar tracks, but not in the way that they've used them in the past. Like, not on Personal Jesus or a song like martyr or um even suffer well they're more processed this album and i'll be interested to see if anybody disagrees with me disagrees with me but they really pitched off the bluesy vibe and they went with more synth sensibilities than they have certainly off of delta machine um if they were moving away from that on spirit they got away from it almost completely on memento mori and so i the guitars really don't stick out to me on this album, apart from Never Let Me Go on My Favorite Stranger. Um, and Wagging Tongue, but that's really, really processed on that on that song. So 
Like if you would like if I was mentioning what gets what sticks out musically, the synth work, some of the beat patterns, but guitars would be way down on the uh, on the list. All right, uh, moving on. Roma Ed writes. Firstly, let me say I wish you great healing regarding your leg. Thank you. It's getting better every day, but it still hurts and it's still bruised from my <laughs> my whole leg is bruised. It's one big, huge, gigantic purple bruise. Um, I'm glad that you've got to listen to Memento Mori. Uh, I have some questions. Do you think Dave feels a bit sad knowing that Richard Butler paired up with Martin to write songs instead of him? I don't think so based off of that um, Mojo article. Dave doesn't seem to hide that stuff very well. And considering the fact that he was writing with Christian Eigner and Peter Gordino as well, and given how well he knows Martin and how Martin keeps things so, you know, held so closely, that um, I don't think that he was bothered by it. I you know, I think that he was just glad to get some great songs. I also watched this new interview where Dave says he was surprised to hear Butler sings on the demos and not Martin. Uh, I had no idea that Dave and Martin had this relationship. I always thought they were the best of buddies. Yeah, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, I had to give them, DM, credit for their professionalism, for focusing on their music regardless of who comes and goes, uh, Vince, Allen, and now Fletch. Yeah, I do too. Um it reminded me it reminded me a lot of the what I've seen of like radio shows where you would be surprised to learn that radio shows that have multiple team members a lot of times are not friends outside of the studio and the only time that they talk is when they're on the air. Um that's what was so devastating for me when my best friend Drew passed away about a month after uh fletch did last year because we genuinely were best friends and in the studio and outside the studio so when we were working together in tucson we would actually call each other on the way to work and talk and yeah that's 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 why that whole situation that whole um his passing was was so uh was so incredibly uh incredibly difficult all right let's get back to um some more of your listener feedback. James Coulter writes from the MyNerdWorld.net page, I'm wondering if you have any information regarding the deluxe version of Memento Mori yet. Will there be a second disc of exclusive remixes, additional tracks? Um, I haven't heard. I, I Initially, we'd heard there were going to be like four B-sides, but we still haven't gotten the single release for Ghosts again. So I don't know what's going on with this deluxe edition and have not seen um, anything in the way of you know what uh what the deluxe edition will entail beyond perhaps a um a booklet so you know we'll have to we'll have to all wait and find out i still haven't ordered mine yet i'm still trying to decide where i want to uh where i want to order it uh, order it from so all right uh clara writes uh let's see here i must say the description of the upcoming album tracks makes me want to listen to it even more can't thank you enough for sharing uh, my DM story on the new episode. Also want to say that I loved watching the premiere of Ghosts again, the music video with my friends, and don't and uh, don't know if some of you feel the same way, but uh, uh, the final handshake between Dave and Martin made me think directly of the famous handshake between the band members and Daniel Miller that sealed the band's contract back in 1980, as if a circle was now perhaps closed. I also listened to the song over and over and was very touched when, during the interview following their performance on the French television show, the presenter decided to pay tribute to Andrew by tr projecting a photo of him. This marks one of the many celebrations of his memory that will take place throughout the tour and with the fans, I'm sure. Uh, best regards, Clara. Thank you, Clara. Uh, let's see. Uh, this comes from a oh, friend of the show, Stephanie, in Germany. Apart from the music, which we are all terribly curious about, I would like to mention another aspect, which is no less important. We've seen a couple of performances of them now, and I'm thrilled with their outfits. Those suits and shoes of Dave's are incredibly, uh, incredibly beautiful, wonderfully chosen, uh, because due to the times, white jeans, white armpit shirt, and a leather jacket doesn't work anymore of a man of Dave's age. It's a feast for the eyes. Martin uh, Martin's outfits are always a bit more eccentric, uh, eccentric, but he never seems dressed up. Likewise, Peter Gordino and Kristen Eigner um, always matched perfectly. You see, it's the whole package that excites me. Uh, I'm uh, I'm glad I've had this band in my life for so long, 
and can let myself fall into this world uh, when the world and its news out there is too hard to bear. I hear that. That's it from me today. I hope you are happy and the best of health. I'm getting there. I can walk around. <laughs> All the best from me, uh, Stephanie. All right. Uh, I got a few more here. Uh, Michigan Mego or Mego Maniacs writes, I was hoping for an album with a more layered, more uh, full production. Personally, I don't enjoy Depeche Mode's deconstructed, raw, crunchy, underproduced. I like it when there are different layers, sounds, and beats to explore with each new listen. This album so far sounds like a genuine return to form with strong melodies and harmonies. I also got tired of the slow tempo bluesy stuff. Depeche Mode, Sweet Spot, Violator, Ultra, Songs of Faith and Devotion. I think you will be happy. Thank you. Definitely layered, that's for sure. Um, Tokyo Skyline writes, Hearing those touching stories of how listeners reached out um, to DM to help them through loss makes me wonder if Depeche Mode is actually French for comfort blanket. The power of music is amazing (laughs) thank you uh tokyo skyline i appreciate that and with that it wraps up this week's uh, episode which went of course way longer than i had expected thank you so much uh for checking out the show i'm sure i'll have uh, further thoughts uh, on the album in uh, upcoming uh, episodes got more listener feedback and fan spotlights to get to uh as uh, well and any questions that you have feel free to email me talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on youtube and uh, i will try to answer as many of those as i can and i have been trying to answer as many of those as i can before i let you go uh let me go ahead and do a pitch for my science fiction space opera series if you love depeche mode which you do and you read sci-fi or know somebody who does treat yourself a friend or a family member with science fiction Set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture, inspired in part by Depeche Mode, life in the so-called space age, the world we live in and life in general, Depeche Mode plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story and the main character himself is a massive Depeche Mode fan at a time when the music of the 80s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters of the story. The stories feature references to your favorite band, both direct and indirect, while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. The story for Embark Book 1 goes as follows. Taft Guardia has found something, and humanity won't survive without it. The stars are within reach, as rival mega corporations Decorp and Entercon have made interstellar travel available to the masses. But when an industrial accident sets off an apocalyptic chain of events, all of Earth is at risk. Meanwhile, Taft picked the right day to upgrade his ship when fellow pilot Kay Tamaro arrived, needing his help investigating a cryptic message from her late aerospace engineer father. Unaware of the disaster, Taft and Katha make a shocking discovery. Excitement turns to fear as the global evacuation begins, and the ruthless sent to Argum of D-Corp learns of the power in their possession. Taft soon realizes what Katha's father left behind might be the only key to saving Earth's evacuees from the tyranny of D-Corp's evil leader. If you like your science fiction epic filled with some romance and action, then Embark is perfect for you. It's written for adults, but it's great for ages 11 years old and over. Pick up Embark Book 1 today, available in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Seven books in the entire series available now at Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. Just search for Embark and John J O N Justice. Thank you so much for spending some time on my rambling thoughts about Depeche Mode. I greatly appreciate it, and I look forward to hearing from you between now and next week. I hope wherever you are, You are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. And I'll talk to you again real soon. Bye.